Restoring the Culture is hosted by Tanya Taylor Rubenstein, Story Mentor, and Camille Adair, Family Constellation Facilitator. In this podcast, these long-term friends explore how stories serve our lives. Their inquiry meanders into the realms of science, theater, health, and consciousness, moving the individual and global narratives forward as they draw upon their relationship as the laboratory for their experiments in truth. So many of us feel isolated and alone in our deepest longings. Each one of us is necessary in rediscovering the truth of our human story and listening to what is calling us forward so that we can restory the culture together. Camille is going to jump in and share our quote that relates to our topic this week. Hey everyone. So this um, this quote on restoring the body was um, from Humming the Blues by Cass Daglish. You're not a trophy, not some kind of ornament, a decoration for the sky. You're a priest. You're the healer. You're the wild God who turns her ear toward heaven, who digs her feet into the earth, who whispers in the wind. And that quote felt really appropriate for where we're at in the world right now. Just And so we're here to, to honor the body, to honor the body during uh, a time when, when things related to the body feel very fragile, and also to, to talk about how we can restory the body as part of restoring culture. So we're going to start out with Tanya actually talking about um, where she sees people, her clients, and and people that she's been working with for decades, how um, how what is their relationship to the body in terms of story? Hmm. Thanks so much, Camille. And first, I just want to acknowledge that incredibly powerful quote that you shared. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that it's March twenty second, twenty twenty. And we are in about a week into, for most people, some a little more, some a little less here in the U.S., into um, being asked to quarantine, self-quarantine. Certain cities in the U.S. have um, the stay, stay in place thing happening. So I want to acknowledge we're in quite a moment with the body. And in terms of the work I've done, so for really about the past two decades, um, starting with my own work as a solo performer, but then moving on and holding space as a story worker with such a diversity of people. I've worked with veterans. I've worked with um, over 100 people who've experienced cancer in their bodies, as well as their beloveds, people with HIV, AIDS. I've worked with uh, marginalized voices. I've worked with um, prostitutes, um, gay, uh, lesbian, transgender people. Uh, so I'm really um, Palestinian and Israelis with you on peace monologues many, many uh, years ago. We did these incredible shows helping people open up their stories. And what I want to say in terms of the relationship to the body, um, to me, okay, a couple of things. The, the, the issues that create the most suffering on the planet related to the body, I think if I look at, if I can pull it back in a few different lenses, one is um, believing that one only is a body because one has not opened up to the experience of the soul, the deeper knowing of the soul and has been indoctrinated through religion, through, you know, we know the whole, everything we're always talking about, patriarchy, educational systems, family systems. And I also want to acknowledge that it's trauma. In my experience with people, grief and trauma, unprocessed grief and trauma primarily, that blocks the ability to A, right, connect with that greater sense of identity that we're soul, not just the body, that there's something bigger going on here in a field bigger than what we experience in the physical. So there's a lot about that, but also that grief and trauma block people, which is why it's so important to sign the words to speak, to write through the stories, including writing through the grief, trauma, marginalized identities, and painful experiences, because when those things are unspoken, 
and there's a sense of this is too taboo to be spoken, or this goes against my religion to speak it, or it goes against my family to speak it. That continues to keep people locked in to a relationship with their body that is very frightening and very, um, I think, leads to a lot of other behaviors that don't serve, including addiction, including, I mean, it can go in a lot of different directions, right? So the biggest thing I want to say is that trauma and grief unprocessed blocks the ability to tell the deeper stories and shift the identification in terms of, yes, I'm a body, and it's, but I'm a I'm, as that poem said, I'm a priest in the body. I'm the wildness in the body. I'm the infinite, I'm connected to the infinite in the body and that the body's not in contradiction to it, actually. The body's the vessel to get there and the stories are the vessel to get there. So now, Camille, if I can turn the question around to you in your work with ancestral healing you have such an amazing background you've been a a clinician you were formerly a hospice nurse you've done so much work including as a documentary filmmaker around death and dying and and you're you (laughs) you're my wonderful friend and you're you and you're such a full being and person like what's what's your way in with this topic of um you know the the aspect of the relationship to the body and those you've worked with in yourself, but primarily, let's say those you've worked with through the years um, where, where there's a calling for the, for the um, topic, for the, the identity to be restored. Well, I think um, a lot of what I've learned in working with people over the years, both people who are dying And people as a family constellation facilitator and teacher, I I would say that um, if I start thinking about the dying first, you know, when people know that the physical body is is the temporary shell, they start to identify oftentimes with a deeper part of themselves. Right. I mean, that's the that's really the invitation at the time of death. And hopefully we do it before then. That was a lot of my work is how to bring the wisdom of what dying people go through that actually allows them to be more alive at the end of their lives. How do we bring that to the living? And that's relevant in these times right now with the scare of the coronavirus, the real, very real uh, threat to our our human lives. And um, so I think, you know, there's a liberation that comes from that when people, uh, on the one hand, um, they they get in touch with that part of them that is greater than than just the physical body and at the same time there can be a real tenderness and a real surrender to and this body has been the beloved vehicle that's taken me through this lifetime and having a deeper appreciation of it and and also just how it's you know it's very humbling that when we experience pain you know oftentimes we forget about how difficult it can be to be in a body right now everyone's obviously we're all trying to avoid exposure to the virus right i also have seen so many people at the end of life who can't wait to leave they mm-hmm. you know, literally one of the most common things that hospice people will say is i can't wait when am i you know when can i go home and it's and that's not a product of dementia that really is a when you start to feel like you're almost there but you're still in this body and the heaviness of the body and the pain of the body start to almost weigh the soul down and um so i guess that then really leads me to my constellation work and and what it's been like for the last you know 12 to 15 years to really be able to like grow myself in that framework and and my and it's changed my work and so it's um as when you're in a constellation, as you know, Tanya, because you're such a, an incredibly highly sensitive constellation representative in your own right, that when you step into the knowing field in that way, your body becomes like a tuning fork for the soul beyond space and time. And so the body is an instrument. And I guess mm-hmm. what I've been really working with more and more is this, this, this body has this incredible circuitry. We have you know, we have the, the, the intelligence of 
the microbiome in the gut. You know, we have the heart intelligence that has more receptors than the brain, right? We're so used to relying on the brain, but we're realizing that we have more than just one intelligence. And, um, and we're learning how to use that. I have, there's a physician, retired physician who I meet with uh, periodically uh, to uh, to do work with in terms of because we're both family constellation facilitators and and he has this wonderful process that he calls lending his nervous system and so it's he's taken what he's learned as a family constellation representative and facilitator and he actually brings that sort of into daily life with people in a presencing way that's very healing and so i think we're just now sort of um, skimming the surface for what's available in terms of healing and in terms of empathy through the body. We know that the brain has mirror neurons. Um, so I would say that we can actually be in service to the soul through the sacred instrument of the body. And I think that's the big, that's the big shift of moving into a more feminine way of relating to one another in the body. So I guess now what I'd love to hear from you, Tanya, um, because you're actually somebody who I feel like has, you you have such a big soul and a big spirit, and you have found ways that I've seen to really express that in the body in mm -hmm. ways that have been inspiring to me. I think, you know, you, you have kind of a, you've had a radical path on many levels, and I would include the body in that mm -hmm. way. And I just wonder then... Um, how do you restore your own body in terms of how to, in terms of restoring the culture? Mm, thank you for that. And I loved what you said. The body is a tuning fork and you're coming through the healer's perception um, background, but I started as an actor and every actor knows this. The and, and I stumbled into my acting abilities. I guess it was always in me, but when it started manifesting was right after my grandfather's death. And literally on the day he died, I was 14 years old and I'd been interested in acting before. It was the day of my first acting class. And my mom said, should I cancel? You know, grandpa died in the night and I was in grief and this bigger part of my soul was just like, no, I want to go. And that I was handed a monologue. Basically, I went outside of my body. I channeled all my own grief, loss, pain into this character. And I didn't remember anything. I went outside of myself. Something greater came through me. And all I remember was coming through in the spotlight. It was my first monologue with tears in my eyes and my classmates, maybe 10 other um, teen, teenage people, standing on their feet, giving me a standing ovation. I didn't know what had happened, um, but it, most actors can have a story like this. Usually it's a genesis story of when they really knew acting was it because what we're doing as artists and musicians do this too, performing artists of all kinds, dancers and speaking of the body and the embodiment, when we're at, when we're really with our gift, we're stepping out of the way in the body to allow the soul to use us as an instrument. And when you see great, great actors like Meryl Streep, for example, or somebody who, you know, what's happening is an alchemical process. What's happening, see, there's an interest, there, my work has been so much about the intersection of art and performing artists, and as well as writers and expressing the stories. But through the body, what happens is, um, with the when it when it really happens is it's alchemical and it's transcendent for the performer and the audience and so a shift in consciousness a healing a soul retrieval takes place for the performer and their gift is that the the audiences experience it in some way too so so much of my own path has been reconciling and trying to really find my place in my body um, which has always been super connected to the soul, but the forms it's wanted to come through have shifted. 
throughout time. There was a time when I didn't want to act anymore, but I wanted to use that energy for storytelling. And something I want to just get back to that you said to me many years ago that was very influential to me and, and the way I've continued to work with artists and and uh, healers and, and performing artists and writers to help them get their stories out there, whether they're professionals or not. To me, everybody has the right to tell their story. But something when we were doing hospice monologues together, which was a collaboration many years ago that you and I did with caregivers and hospice and professional and people who just lost loved ones sharing their stories was um, something you said to me about that there had been some kind of research at the time that those who could tell their stories before they died had an, had a, um, an easier death, a, a more peaceful death. And like, to me, that comes back to the body because just like we don't, the body doesn't deserve to be objectified I think even in spiritual circles, it doesn't need to be marginalized. The body um, and storytelling and being able to tell our stories through our bodies and really honor our unique human experience, not from a place of ego, but from a place of this is me, I mattered, I live, this is my story. And the way we humans make meaning of that, that that can allow for a different kind of transition, it can also allow for a legacy and for teaching that can be here in service after the body is no longer here. And so to me, that's, this is like, this is some of the stuff that for me has been about restoring my relationship to the body. And I live so in the field of stories and what I see through stories is the beauty of every person that the over-identification with the body doesn't allow to be seen sometimes in the culture. So restoring to me is through our bodies, these sacred vessels, every story is beautiful and the person becomes more in touch with their beauty. So from your point of view, what's What's been part of your relationship to yourself, your body, your own work that that has shifted, that has been about restoring how you hold body from the way the conditioning and all starts to where you're at? I think I've been very impacted personally by the collective story of being a woman in a body. Um, my relationship to beauty, my relationship to shame, my relationship to hiding, um, you know, sort of like how our vulnerability makes itself so apparent through the body. I think that that's something that I've been working with my whole life. But I, I do know that there is some way in which the physical body holds the stories of our lives. And I also know from my family constellation work that the physical body holds the story of the generations. So it's not just the story of this one life. We carry the story of our ancestors in our bodies. And so the more we can tell the stories of our lives, we can, you know, talk about our memories. And the more we get in touch with our ancestry, even if you don't have details and facts, there are ex exercises that I teach and lead my clients through and ways in which even if you don't know anything about where you come from in terms of your your ancestral lineage, there are ways to get in touch with that. And when you feel that in your body, there is a release that is freeing because on the one hand, you become freed from the thing that was holding you in silence. You also get free to build on all the resilience of all the, the generations that actually allowed each one of us to have life. All the hard work that, you know, we talk about generational trauma and we very seldom talk about generational resilience, but there's been a huge amount of resilience for, you know, my ancestors who left Sweden, likely because, you know, because of hardship and very cold temperatures. And, you know, I had ancestors who came over from Ireland around the potato famine. And, you know, it's, I mean, we think about all that people went through to pass life on. And there's a tremendous amount of resilience and there's also a tremendous amount of trauma. So I think it's really beautiful because now we have information, knowledge, and tools for how to kind of work with that, the, the, the woven structure between trauma and resilience. 
and that and how that has been laid down inside of us. Uh, I have had a real interest in learning more about female sexuality because I do believe that in a way there's there's been research that women are really cut off from their sexuality so that in some in some ways we have been cut off from the waist down and 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 that keeps us living a, a kind of half life so part of for me uh, this process of embodiment this process of being more connected to mother earth has to do with also being more connected to like you know sexuality as our birthright and that could be probably a whole other podcast but just to say that i think sexuality is one of the beautiful aspects to being in body. Um, and I want to just say one more thing, and that has to do with this deep healing that I've been experiencing in the constellation work, where when I'm, it happens, it can happen virtually as well. I work with people on Zoom, but when I've been in big groups, I oftentimes will have women sit down on the floor in a maternal line and they lean back into each other and hold each other. And we can go back six, seven generations. And what starts to happen for these women when I do this process of reweaving, and sometimes I even bring in mother's milk and I move the mother's milk through the line because you can see where the mother's milk was actually interrupted in the female line. And then the sweetness of life has been interrupted. And so to be able to actually use our physical bodies in service of other people it also is in service of ourselves, but there is something, this intersection about working with the body on behalf of the soul. It is such a great tool. And I think we're just waking up to that opportunity. I love that Camille. And um, yeah, very provocative. And I, it made me want to share a little bit about my own story um, in terms of both sexuality and the mother's milk. So, uh, you know, and there is, there's, and I love what you say, and it's been so much of my healing um, process to work with you on ancestral work and be in my own kind of um, uh, relationship to a soul retrieval around my mother and my grandmother and my great grandmother and my great grandfather, including even though he was the uh, sexual abuse perpetrator of lines in the family. It's like starting to, um, and not with spiritual bypass, I'm not suggesting that at all. And wherever people are at in their process, it's very important to work through whatever the fear, the anger, the sense of betrayal, all of the, it's the trauma and grief work. But then what opens up is like this greater story. And to me, when we're titrating our personal stories, with the bigger story with our families and then taking that out into the community, the collective, the cosmos, we are multidimensional beings. And it's another way we've been marginalized is like, and even like to me, it's like, well, I, I literally had have, have had therapists that have kind of made it seem like, well, my trauma is my trauma and I'm just going to have to be in that trauma for the rest of my life. Or we want to validate the anger. We want to make that person a devil or a monster rather than really going deep enough. And it's really about the depth. Because on a certain level, we can say some people and objectify them as monsters. That's what we, we have these relationships of objectifying both men and women for very different reasons. And that's part of being cut off from our real sense of power in the body, connection to the earth, connections to our lineage. I know what I was saying. So when I was born, my grandmother said to my mom, um, my mom had an impulse to want to breastfeed me, and this was in 1964. And my, my we lived in a family home, four generations, and you know all that came along with that. Some of it was opinions from the elders that may or may not have served. But my mom's impulse was to breastfeed me, and my grandma, my nanny, who I love, she passed on about 11 years ago, and I feel very connected to her and close to her these days. But she said to my mom, "You wouldn't want to do that because people would think we didn't have the money to buy." Um, formula, right? And this is a common story I've heard as a story worker. There was some version of that shame, um, you know, we, we know like in terms of the big picture of the body of the world in Africa, you know, the, the Nestle and, you know, corporations shaming women with very little money, you know, all of the. And so when I 
breastfed my daughter Chloe till she was, I breastfed her until she wanted to stop, which was around three years old. And I just surrendered my body to my daughter's desire and to her need and to her want more than just the need. It became at a certain point, she could live without the breast milk, but it was a want, a desire. And it was a huge surrender. It was the biggest surrender of my life, of my body, in the sense of letting my breast be stretched out and like all the things you were talking about. But what was very interesting to me is after that time period, I came into my body. I got in my body in some ways for the first time in life. And that's how my daughter, you know, that was like this reciprocal relationship that I felt more in my body one when I actually birthed her. But that was part of birthing myself into my body and then the breastfeeding. And not to at all shame anybody or say this is the path for everybody. I just personally, though, that that breaking the, the, the thing of some generations being cut off from the actual breast milk from the mother, from the early connection to the mother and how that restored something in me. And interestingly, right, you know, a few years after that, I had been in relationships with men for my whole life. And I had my first sexual relationship in my late thirties with a woman. And it was the first time I felt pleasure sexually. And it was because I was cut off from in my head and I'm not, I don't identify as a lesbian, nor do I identify as straight. I've had experiences with men and with women, and I'm currently married to a transgender person, um, uh, female to male. But what I want to say was I, I was fluid and I was longing to have um, something returned to me that I didn't even know I wanted because it was so out of my thoughts about myself and my body and what I should have, that I wouldn't have even known that that unknown could bring me such pleasure. And it brought me into a journey that began in my late 30s. And I really feel that the most sexual pleasure I've had, as well as connection to my body has been from about 38 to now at 55, and not totally linearly. And there were times when I did not feel that. And but um, have landed in my sexual wholeness in some relationship in how I mothered and being in my body and the way I surrendered to serve my daughter and not in an um, not serve the way we are conditioned to serve men uh, and 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 remove ourselves from our pleasure. It was just a big surprise and it came from a return to my own feminine and in, and there was something that healed in my maternal legacy for sure. Beautiful. I love the courage you bring to sharing. I really want to say I appreciate that so much about you. And I want to go back to something that you said in the very beginning. Um, and then we're going to, we'll wrap up the show. Um, but when you talked about the sexual perpetrator in your family, your grandfather and or great grandfather, and how that was something that you, that you were even taking deeper. And I just want to say, that is so politically incorrect. And it's so courageous to say that and from a family constellation standpoint, I, what I want to just contribute to that is um, it takes so much courage to go to the point of disruption in, in one's line. And you find that, and, and I can guarantee you what I always find as a facilitator is that at that point of disruption where we find a perpetrator, there's always a big story for that person that includes suffering and where the lineage was broken for them. So it's not about blame. It's not about, it's not even about forgiveness. It's about going in and, and reordering a system, bringing health to a system that has been disturbed where something has been missing and something needs to be seen and, and acknowledged. And it's just such deep work. And I admire uh, the degree to which you've been willing to do that in your own healing. And it's something that you and I have been walking out together as friends for many years in our families, but also in our friendship. Like, you know, the all those things that apply to a system, a family system, apply to a friendship, apply to a job, apply to a community. So to be able to learn these principles is a big part of, I think, how you and I are restoring the culture 
by restoring. Um, I would say that I have looked a lot around sexuality and sexual health, and I've seen the wounding in both men and women um, around sexual shame, around roles, around uh, how the brain has been wired through um, visualizations such as pornography. I think that that's a big thing in our culture, um, and it and it actually disconnects us from the body. And it, and it reinforces objectification, which makes us lonely. And I think for me, intimacy has become really a big part of my work. When I talk about relearning human connection, that's really the work of intimacy. That is my, that's really the tagline of all of my work is how do we work with the split, both the internal split and the splits outside of ourselves. And I think um, I'll just share this story I had of, uh, I was receiving a massage and I was in um, another city for work. And it was a massage therapist who has a really broad set of skills in terms of, of healing. And, um, and I remember, um, he put his hands on my stomach and, you know, massage therapists don't usually massage the abdomen anymore. Like the body, you know, we've like, I used to be a massage therapist, so I know how it's changed. And I know how more boundaried it is. And we compartmentalize the safe areas and the not so safe areas. And the draping has even changed. And But I remember he, my, my bare abdomen was exposed. And I remember he just looked at my belly and he just said, this is where you held life. And he was so loving and so honoring of my female vessel as a woman in her 50s who's who's given birth that I literally started crying and I cried and cried and cried and and he held that with so so much tenderness and I'll never forget that so I just also want to say that love bringing love and respect to the body it has tremendous healing potential and we oftentimes don't get that through sexuality yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more, Camille. And like this whole restoring the body of our individual bodies is restoring the world to me. Like everything micro is macro. And I think about Eve Ensler's amazing play that she wrote after she had ovarian cancer when she really was shifting her relationship radically and making some big connections. And it's called In the Body of the World. And she was speaking about like the women in the Congo who had gone through some some unbelievable abuse. I mean, the depth of the abuse of the, the rapes and the sexual abuse, but seeing as a metaphor in her own body, but she was connecting the micro and the macro. And I want to say, and again, never is bypassed, but by the way, to restory that, um, my family story about the sexual perpetrator in my family took over 20 years of me addressing it. And he did come to me in meditations as a little boy weeping and weeping and weeping. And I couldn't turn away from this little boy weeping. And I had to bring that little boy in my heart and I could feel, though I may never know the details of the bigger story there, right? So, and it took a lot of work and it in, involved killing my mother wound. And I won't get too far into that, but the micro is the macro. If there's anything we're learning in this moment, right? With the coronavirus, we are a global body as well as the individual body. We are one in, we're being taught that in a very real way and all our stories and responses impact everything. So this is a time, you know, to honor our body, take care of our body, pleasure our body, restore our relationship. Like you said, the softness, being gentle with ourselves in the body, because how else are we going to learn how to restore our relationships with others and with the mother earth, you know, herself. So um, it's a big time, isn't it? Big time. Yeah. And so just sending everybody so much love, and tenderness, and we are walking out new stories together. We are being called to walk into the unknown and into the mystery. And I was just sharing with Camille this morning, I woke up knowing that after hearing about this so for so many years, feeling it in myself, 
the divine feminine or the feminine, the feminine essence, however you frame that, the new feminine that's been emerging on the planet. It is, it's not like that will be driving us in the future. It is here. And the divine feminine includes the sacred masculine. Really important to say the masculine, it's not the time for us to turn around and objectify or ostracize or cast out the masculine. It's bringing in a new way of being. The feminine has place just like any real story circle or ancestral circle for everyone and everything. So we're being asked to create new, not only ways of being, but containers. So just sending everybody so much love. Thank you for joining Camille and Tanya for this episode of Restoring the Culture. If you are inspired, we would deeply appreciate it if you would leave a review on iTunes or any other platform where you heard our podcast. For more ongoing inspiration and support, please join our no-cost global Facebook community, Restoring the Culture. You can support our podcast by making a donation here. And remember, we are each restoring the culture as we restory our own lives. See you next time.